I'm Johanna Derlega, I'm publisher of The Hill, and welcome to this morning's briefing, America's Opioid Epidemic, Search for Solutions. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Indivier, for making this possible. Our conversation today is devoted to a public health crisis. Every day, 91 Americans lose their lives to an opioid overdose. The President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis has recommended the designation of this epidemic as a national emergency. As the White House takes steps in that direction, what other strategies are being considered at all levels to tackle this crisis? On the program today, we will hear from lawmakers, addiction experts, researchers, and recovery advocates about solutions that will be helpful in curbing this immense challenge. First, uh, just a few notes of housekeeping. In addition to those of you in the studio, we are live streaming on thehill.com. Uh, we ask that you keep your phones on silent, but we encourage you to join the conversation on social media. You can do that by following us on Twitter, at The Hill Events, and you can comment using the hashtag opioid solution. We're gonna be taking questions throughout the program, so keep an eye out for uh, members of the team that have handheld mics. And finally, there is a very short uh, survey on your chairs. We appreciate any feedback you could give us, so uh, do fill that out at the end of the program. So let's dive right in. Uh, we begin with Senator Rob Portman. Uh, for the more than two decades, Senator Portman has been working to help combat the opioid crisis starting with the founding of a community anti-drug coalition in 1996 when he was a member of the House of Representatives. In the years since, he has authored and helped pass several pieces of legislation to provide those at the front lines with funding and the tools to curb this epidemic. Welcome, Senator Portman. And joining him is my colleague, The Hill's Editor-in-Chief, Bob Cusack. Welcome, Senator. Hey. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us. Um, you know, this is an epidemic, and, and personally, I didn't realize the extent of it until I got outside the Beltway and went to New Hampshire in uh, the fall of 2015, and then Ohio in 2016. Can you describe how this is, for people who don't know and who are watching on our live stream, who, the, the devastating impact uh, stories how this is affecting uh, everyday people? Yeah, first of all, the, the word epidemic is a strong word. Mm -hmm. um, and Sometimes I get pushed back uh, until people understand what's going on. And uh, it's the number one public health crisis in our state, let's put it that way. Um, I believe that's true in the nation now. Uh, a couple of statistics that I'm sure you're familiar with, but some folks might not be, it's the number one cause of accidental death in America. It has been in Ohio probably since 2007. In other words, it's now surpassed car accidents, car accidents yeah. as the number one cause of death. Uh, it's also something that affects everyone in a very direct way, which is that it's the number one cause of crime. So in the communities I represent, whether I talk to a county sheriff, a police chief in a city, or whether I talk to the state highway patrol and look at it from a statewide perspective, uh, they all believe that uh, because of not just the drug use or even the trafficking, but because of the crime associated with it to pay for the habit, uh, it's causing our jails to be overcrowded, which affects every single person in the community. And so it's theft, it's shoplifting, it's other crimes associated with it. Uh, and then finally, and most importantly to me, uh, you know, it is not just resulting in these overdoses and deaths which get more attention, but it is ruining the opportunities for literally hundreds of thousands of Ohioans every day who become addicted. They may not overdose and die, mm -hmm. uh, but they have left their families. Uh, they have made the drug as many addicts and recovering addicts have told me the uh, most important thing in their life, crowding out friends and family and job. So it's, you know, it's one of these issues that affects the fabric of our society in really fundamental ways. And I think it's fair to say we've never seen anything like it. You know, I've been doing this for uh, many years. I started an anti-drug coalition 20 some years ago in my hometown at a time when the issue was cocaine. Mm -hmm. Marijuana, uh, to a certain extent, sent meth. Um, uh, this, is, this is very different. That organization is still in existence, but it's focused now on uh, the issue of fentanyl and heroin, uh, prescription drugs, and um, because that's unfortunate where we, we see the huge increases. And by the way, when we take our, our eye off the ball, this always happens. So if, if we do uh, focus so much on the fentanyl and 
heroin issue, the opioid issue, to the extent that we're able to be more successful than we have been, and the statistics are really sad, it's increasing, not decreasing, it's getting worse, not better, uh, then something else will crop up, and it'll be cocaine coming back, mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, there's some evidence of already in some of our communities. It'll be meth, crystal meth from Mexico, for instance, now is very strong coming into some of our communities. So I, I will say it's a, it's, a, it's a broader issue about uh, a, a society, our society, that has struggled over the years with different kinds of drugs. Um, this one has hit us harder than any. You, you've uh, authored legislation that be, has become law. You have pending legislation on this issue. What, what are some of the lessons learned? Uh, and, and tell us about the, the pending bills we were talking about before we came on. Well, first of all, I, I applaud Congress because in the last year and a couple of months, more has been done on this issue than ever in history. And, and I refer to the CARE legislation, the Comprehensive Addiction mm -hmm. Recovery Act, which was passed last July. Uh, I wish it were being implemented more quickly, frankly. Um, I think you'll see some of the grants begin to be announced here in the next couple weeks. For those of you uh, involved in this and in the audience who have been helping with some of the uh, grant writing because there are eight different grant programs, uh, everything from you know, helping with regard to providing Narcan, which is this life-saving drug that reverses the effects of overdoses, to helping pregnant women and helping kids that are born with, this, with the dependency. So that's ha starting to happen. It's being implemented. Some of the legal changes uh, that are in the law took effect immediately, but the grant programs is where we're going to see, I think, more of the difference. And then second, at the end of last year, we passed legislation called the Cures Act, mm -hmm. which is part of the appropriations process, which, as compared to CARA, which gives this year, by the way, uh, $267 million authorized at $181 million. So we increased the amount in the appropriation, which was good. Cures, on the other hand, is $500 million. That goes directly to the states as compared to going to uh, nonprofits and, and other organizations. And so both of those things are helping. In the state of Ohio, for instance, the Cures money is already being used. Some really creative programs uh, in central Ohio, Franklin County, which is the Columbus area. We are in the process of taking uh, a little more than a million dollars from the Cures Act, putting it against some other local resources and creating something to help deal with what I think is one of the biggest issues right now in treatment, which is this gap between someone who uh, has an overdose, goes to an emergency room, and then getting them into treatment. And it's sort of a, uh, it's a, it's a center where EMS personnel will take firefighters and others who are responding to these overdoses, will take people to one place, which will be an emergency room set up for overdoses. And at that same place, there will be 50 beds for treatment mm -hmm. and strong incentives for people to go into treatment. Because that's where we see a lot of the drop off. Uh, people. At the time at which they overdose and Narcan is applied, sometimes that is an opportune moment to get into treatment, but it's not immediately available. So that's an example of where the Cures Act is being used right now in Ohio to make a difference. What about the, the, the fraud in this issue? There's been reports of that, a big one in, in Florida, of these homes that, that are, are, are basically scamming the system. And, um, a well-intended federal law, a local officials say, and uh, some of it was in Obamacare. Um, but how do you crack down uh, on the fraud where people think they're getting treatment, but they're actually not? They're just, they're just getting scammed. Yeah, we have to be very careful about where the money's going, how it's being used. That, that uh, particular issue does not relate directly to cures or care. I'm right. But it does relate to sober living facilities and the fact that, you know, some, uh, and Florida's an example, but frankly, it's happening in other parts of the country, too, where we're, we're told. Uh, so you have to have adequate enforcement to ensure that people are getting the treatment that they deserve. It's so bad that in some of those places, as I understand it, um, drugs are being provided to the people who live there yes. to uh, essentially keep them dependent. And so obviously that, that needs to be policed. Um, and look, there's, there's uh, any time you have uh, significant new funding sources, which we have here, there has to be oversight. We had a uh, an oversight hearing recently at the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations on this whole issue of fentanyl and why it's happening and spreading and what can be done. And uh, this is where, over time, we have come up with this legislation called the STOP Act, which says basically that the post office ought to provide law enforcement with the information on packages that are coming in. Because unlike heroin, unlike meth, uh, unlike cocaine and other drugs, uh, fentanyl, which is unfortunately growing in my state and in the country as a whole as a, as a threat. In fact, we believe more people died of fentanyl this year from overdoses than heroin in Ohio. Fentanyl, 50 to 100 times stronger than heroin. It's a synthetic form of heroin, a synthetic opioid, uh, is coming through the mail system almost exclusively. And it's coming mostly over, from overseas and, of course, 
uh, based on all the information that we have, mostly from one country, China. And so some evil scientist in China is making this product, uh, shipping it through our US mail system. It's going to a PO box or maybe an abandoned warehouse, mm -hmm. sometimes to traffickers, sometimes based on law enforcement's uh, reports in Ohio directly to users. In other words, not even to a trafficker who then spreads it out. A package, uh, Bob, that is uh, about the size of, of uh, your folder there, mm -hmm. uh, but, but rectangular, uh, could maybe provide 100,000 doses. Uh, 100,000 doses? A few flakes of fentanyl uh, is adequate to cause an overdose, as an example. So hmm. we need to have new laws in place to deal with the reality that this is coming in directly through the system. The one reason traffickers use the mail system is because FedEx, DHL, UPS, private carriers are required by law to provide advanced data on the packages to law enforcement as to where the package is from, where it's going, what's in it. Uh, the post office is not required to do that, although uh, Congress suggested they should do that uh, over a decade ago. So we're trying to bring the post office into the 21st century uh, in this regard. And we're, frankly, we have uh, about 26 co-sponsors now in the Senate, 120 in the House. And we're getting some pushback from the post office. So we need help mm -hmm. to get that legislation done. It won't be the silver bullet. There is no silver bullet, in my view. But it'll certainly help to keep some of this poison out of our communities and to, at a minimum, raise the, the price. Because one reason fentanyl is growing in Ohio is it's less expensive than heroin and more powerful. And the administration has backed that legislation. Or they, yeah, their their, their commission, it? which reported recently, right. uh, talked about the need for federal legislation to deal with this specific problem. And I appreciate that. OK. Um, as you know, on August 10th, President Trump declared a, a national emergency uh, on this issue. Uh, now, since then, critics have said there's been a lack of a follow-up, uh, and some of it is procedural. Uh, but where do we stand with that? And what would you like to see the administration uh, do? Uh, or do you think they've done as much as they can do? Uh, I think they have a commitment to it. I think the president himself has a, a passion for this issue. He's talked about it a lot. You mm -hmm. mentioned New Hampshire, as you know, on the campaign trail, he talked about it a lot. And uh, you know, he's met with recovering addicts, and I think he, he gets it. Uh, but as I said earlier, I think we should move more quickly mm -hmm. in implementing the programs in the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act in particular. It gives them the authorizations to do a number of different things. I applaud uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services for just a couple weeks ago forming the interagency panel, which is authorized under CARA to come up with alternatives to uh, opioids for pain medication, as an example, which is one of the great opportunities we have out there. You know, we need pain medication that is not addictive. And there's no reason the FDA and other parts of the federal government, including HHS, shouldn't be much more aggressive in pushing through the pipeline some of this medication. And um, so that's an example of where, uh, you know, over time they, they, they did move. And my only uh, urging, which is the same thing I said to the Obama administration, uh, because the legislation, again, passed last July, is, you know, this is a crisis. This is not your typical law that needs to be implemented slowly over time, uh, this needs to be implemented with urgency. And uh, you know, again, we're, we're facing an epidemic that is growing. It's clear it's a public health crisis. It's clear that it's affecting everybody uh, in the country, not just those in states like mine that are particularly hard hit. And uh, so it's appropriate the federal government play an, an, an aggressive role in getting this legislation moving. There's a lot going on at the state and local level as well. And we need to be better partners from a federal government perspective. And care and cures. And, this other legislation, the STOP Act we talked about, mm -hmm. is important. We have other legislation on prescription drugs. We, we believe that the CARE legislation uh, could have been stronger with regard to prescription drug monitoring. In the Senate version, we had a provision that was dropped out in conference uh, because of some concerns in the House. We're trying to get that legislation also through the system. Again, we have a bipartisan group of over 20 co-sponsors, and that's to ensure there's an interoperability between us, the states, just knowing what prescriptions people are getting. Mm -hmm. Uh, four to five people in Ohio who overdose on heroin uh, started on prescription drugs. So there continues to be overprescribing. There continues to be a problem here. And that's another piece of legislation that would be good to have the administration strongly support and, and uh, you know, get it across the finish line. And I, I, I want to ask you about that bill. Um, what would it specifically do as far as the monitoring? Um, I know it's a bipartisan bill. Um, but what, uh, and do you think that you, you used to serve in the House. You have a lot of friends in the House. Mm -hmm. that, do you think that the, the House can be persuaded to pass it? I, I do. I do because, uh, again, I think the, the facts are uh, 
so overwhelming that unless we deal with the overprescribing issue, we will continue to see more growth in, in terms of the opioid addiction. Um, two things, I guess, I, I, I would say. One, some states don't have uh, an adequate prescription drug monitoring program for the state itself. Mm -hmm. Ohio has the ORS program, which is working very well. In fact, we've recently taken some steps, and I applaud our, our governor and our attorney general and others to limit prescriptions to seven days. Uh, Maine and other states have done that. Uh, so the legislation helps to encourage states, provide some incentives to set up their own prescription drug monitoring program so that it is an effective program. And then most importantly to me, it provides for this interstate operability, I said earlier. In other words, letting us know in Ohio uh, what happens when some Ohio citizen goes to Kentucky or West Virginia or Pennsylvania or Michigan, and was surrounded by a, a lot of states, um, and gets a prescription filled for an opioid. We want to be sure that gets in the system immediately and that there's an ability for uh, at the pharmacy level and at the provider level, the doctor level, uh, to be able to know what prescriptions people are, are getting uh, so people are not overprescribed. And that's something exclusively that, you know, requires federal help. And mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's what this legislation would provide is an incentive to create that interoperability, which we can do these days. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we have the big data to be able to do this. And uh, in the face of a crisis, it's a, it's a crime we're not doing it. We will open uh, up. Uh, this session for, for questions in a minute. Uh, and so just think of questions and, and uh, when we go to that phase, just identify yourself. Um, I, I wanna get the dynamic on, on Capitol Hill. <clears throat> Other than people in your state, how is this, uh, uh, this is such a bipartisan effort, but have you gotten to know a lot of other members who have approached you to say, actually, this is, this is now happening in my state over the last several years? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, um, I think a few years ago, uh, there was not uh, an appreciation for the degree to which opioids had, had, had spread, and a lot of people hadn't heard much about it. Now I think you can't go home without hearing about it. Uh -huh. And so I would challenge members, and I do this, to go home, and when they go to their fire stations, which a lot of us go to firehouses, to, to thank our firefighters, ask them. And I will guarantee you uh, every firehouse will say they do more heroin runs or opioid runs than they do fire runs. And that's a surprise to our citizens. Again, the notion that this only affects a small group of people is just inaccurate in so many ways. Um, but the opioid crisis does not discriminate. You know, it knows no zip code. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's affecting everybody, rural, urban, suburban, every age group. Um, and it's also affecting every taxpayer, because think about that. If these firefighters are going on more runs to deal with overdoses and using Narcan, which is also an expense, uh, someone's paying for it, and it's it's every citizen. So it, we need to figure out how to help every member to understand that even in a community where it might not be as much of a crisis as it is, say, in Dayton, Ohio, or, or my hometown of Cincinnati, or Columbus, or Cleveland, or Toledo, that it's, it's, it is affecting their community in very fundamental ways. And <coughs> it, it, in every respect, we're gonna have some real experts talk in a minute about the healthcare impact. and. It's hard to overstate that in terms of the impact on emergency rooms. And I was in an emergency room setting recently in Ohio. Uh, again, kind of we're making this transition, I hope, toward this emergency room and treatment center being together. But right now you have you know, very intensive emergency rooms uh, with high costs, uh, dealing with overdoses constantly. And uh, you know, what the nurses uh, tell me is what the EMS professionals tell me is what it's very frustrating for them to have the same person come back again and again and not be able to figure out a way to get that person into treatment. That's something that, uh, again, I think you'll hear some, uh, from some experts on this about other ways to deal with it. The one I talked about is a pretty simple one, which is to have one central place where all the people from a particular county would come and then be able to have the option of going into treatment at that same facility. Uh, when we open up for questions, we have uh, people with mics, and if you can uh, identify yourself and ask your question to the the senators, there's one in the back there. Sorry, hello. Hey. Um, my name is Laura Kelly. I'm from the Washington Times, health reporter there. Um, I was just wondering if there's any conversations about public and private partnerships to harness the power of mobile technology companies that are making phone apps for aiding in recovery. Um, these are things like uh, that are creating social networks for recovering addicts so they can meet and discuss with each other. Um, and just wondering if the federal government wants to support those kind of initiatives. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier some of the really innovative things going on at the state and local level. I, I don't know that at the national level there's um, anything that directly addresses that, but certainly in Ohio it's happening. And as an example, we now have in some of our communities in Ohio a, a new, I mentioned interoperability earlier, I mean sort of an interoperability between um, the social service providers, which is treatment centers, um, and you know, counselors, uh, law enforcement, and uh, this includes uh, law enforcement who are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, frustrated by seeing the same people again and again and see their jails or prisons filling up um, with people who are users when in fact they want to get them into treatment. Um, and then finally, you know, the first responders we, we talked about, which is usually, you know, our EMS professionals. And so as soon as there's an overdose reported, as an example, um, there is a uh, the ability to communicate uh, immediately uh, to the social service providers, so they show up, um, and so does the law enforcement official, and um, then they immediately take this person uh, home or to an emergency room, depending on how severe the overdose has been and what the condition is. And if they go home or if they go to the emergency room, they invite the family to be there, and they have a discussion. Um, and the results are that that person is much more likely to get into treatment and using that moment. So it's, an, it's, a, it's a moment when there's more uh, interest in going into treatment or you know, dealing with what has been, for many addicts, uh, you know, a, 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 mo a time period when they saw their life flash before their, their lives. So in that sense, yeah, there's, there's, there's a, an interest in kind of communicating between all those folks. I don't know if any of the uh, service providers on the, on the internet have been engaged as much, but it's just, it's happening uh, on, on its own at the local level. So I don't know if that responds to your question, but that, that's one of the exciting uses of technology to immediately have people respond. Okay. Uh, good morning, Senator. Uh, Andrew Kessler with the International Substance Abuse Counselors. Thank you so much for being the leader we've, we've needed in Congress uh, when it comes to CARA and 21st Century Cures. Now that we're granting more um, access to care and we um, n are beginning to catch up with the rest of the public health system, um, what do you propose we do about the lack of infrastructure? We need more treatment facilities. We need a greater workforce. We have more people because of parity who can now access care, but all we're really doing, if we don't increase the workforce and the number of facilities that can accept insurance, all we're doing is creating longer lines. So um, what can we do to increase um, and strengthen that infrastructure so that the people who now have access to care can actually receive that care? Yeah, it's a great question. And as you know, some of the Cures money is being used uh, precisely for that. In Ohio, I talked about uh, what Franklin County is doing uh, working, um, actually it, it is a public-private partnership because there's private money going into it as well. It's primarily Cures money, but also uh, county money and, and private sector money, creating a new facility, um, creating new opportunities. So the Cures money is being used for that. It's also Cures is being used for training. And there's some controversy around that. Uh, there's some people who have uh, expressed concern to me that this money is being diverted to the training of counselors, uh, some of the people you probably represent. Uh, and other professionals. Uh, it's not being used directly to encourage more people in the medical profession, uh, more MDs to get into uh, the addiction area, but that's, that's one of our issues and we've got in Ohio, frankly. And you'll hear some, from some professionals about that and some people who have committed their, their lives to the addiction issue. We need more people like that. So that's happening with some of the Cures money and that training is important. And I've made that argument that we need the infrastructure and the infrastructure includes people. Um, so it's beginning to happen, and it's happening out of necessity. Uh, but that, that is one of the issues, is how with the increased demand, how are we going to provide the help and, and frankly do it in a way that's evidence-based. You know, we're not spending money throwing money after a problem without understanding what works and what doesn't work. I talked to a couple of you this morning about treatment, and my question was, as it always is, what's working? What's not, what's not working? Because creating more infrastructure that's not successful, that has people going into three, four, five, six treatment programs uh, without a successful result is, is not the solution. We can't afford that. Not just that it's costly, but we can't afford that in terms of the cost to human lives and families and the, and the, the 
tragedies that we talked about earlier of people not just losing so many people to overdoses and deaths, but so many people who become disconnected from their families and their, and their work and their lives. So yeah, we, we need the infrastructure. We've got to do it right. And um, I, I do think, again, the legislation we've already passed is helping. And then in a lot of local and state instances, people are just taking matters into their own hands and, and, and creating that. In many rural counties in Ohio, there's not an effective treatment program. And so that's where our bigger challenge is, I think, right now, is to figure out how in these rural communities where they have a, a limited tax base, how to help them be able to provide the basic treatment programs, uh, hopefully longer term recovery as well. Um, I, I want to hear from some experts later, but Bob, I will say one of the issues in terms of infrastructure that creates a challenge is not just a short term treatment program, let's say um, eight to 10 week program, which might be typical in Ohio, but how do you get people into longer term recovery? And that involves various levels, but ultimately just a sober housing arrangement, which is costly. And um, yet it is, in my view, so much more successful. So if you look at the number of people who go through a treatment program successfully, it's pretty discouraging, frankly, when you see the percentages. And we'll hear from some experts later again, maybe they can, they can uh, give us some data on that, uh, and maybe some will disagree with me, but I think it's very discouraging. But when you look at the good programs, treatment programs that make that transition between treatment and longer term recovery, and you have the support, including uh, fellow recovering addicts with you, and you have sober living, not like the example used in Florida, but ones right. that are actually serious about um, helping people to get back on their feet, get a job, get back with their families, get back with their kids. Those are the ones that are more successful. But there's a cost associated with that. And the question is, how do you pay for that? Um, so it's. It's a challenge, and um, I hope the hope cures will help, and I hope some of the other efforts that we've talked about uh, with regard to CARA, some of the grants, can be helpful as well in building that infrastructure. We've run out of time, unfortunately. Uh, Senator, thank you for uh, talking about this challenge today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Thank appreciate you. you. Thank you.